Hi everybody, it's Kerry here at the Northeast Autism Society and today we're talking about sensory differences and I have Ashley Jones with me who's going to give us a personal perspective of sensory differences. So hi Ashley, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I'm, I'm Ashley, I'm 35. I, were, I was diagnosed in my mid-twenties, I'm autistic and I'm a quality officer that works here at Northeast Autism Society. Okay. So I suppose when we talk about sensory differences, Ashley, what does that what does that look like for you as an adult? So the main time I suffer with sensory um, difficulties is at work. If I'm being honest with you, um, fortunately I have a manager here at the society, Derek Groves, who um, was given my autism report. We had a meeting, we sat down, we discussed it, we talked through it, and there was some reasonable adjustments put in place to ensure that I could deal with my sensory differences. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of them can be brought on through simple things like communication. If I'm in a team meeting and there are 15 people, I often get nervous about when I should talk or when I shouldn't talk, and that can kind of impact on how I'm feeling emotionally which can lessen my resistance to things like a buzzing sound in a light, or it can lessen my resistance to um, all of the different voices. And I can quickly be kind of come overwhelmed mentally where my brain feels like it wants to shut off. Like I just want to go to sleep and reset. Um, so I have a, an office, um, which is off the main bit where I work which is quite quiet, which helps with the, the noise element. Um, I'm allowed to uh, go for walks to um, get some fresh air and to, to reset because sometimes I don't realize if I'm sat in a certain position, I can go to stand up and my leg will be numb and I won't have realized I'll have been lent on it a certain way because I don't always recognize where my body is and what kind of pressures are on it. Mm -hmm. um, so I sometimes go for walks. Uh, I don't always recognize that I'm hungry. So um, I'm allowed to take my lunch at the same time every day at 11 o'clock. And no matter what I'm doing, I'm fine. I can, it's 11 o'clock, I eat now. I'll go and have my dinner and then I can come back to my desk. Um, there's other things like uh, psychological pressure. As an autistic person, I'm constantly analyzing everything. I'm constantly running through scenarios in my head because I, I feel like I could be getting something wrong or I've misinterpreted something. And that's not because of my experience now. It's because of previous experiences in other jobs where there hasn't been an understanding of autism. And I've been told that I'm nosy or I'm arrogant or I'm a know-it-all or, you know, so dealing with psychological pressure that I put on myself can also impact me in a sensory way because I can become overwhelmed and then I can't deal with the things that are kind of happening around me. So I'm really fortunate that, you know, my, my manager has kind of went through my whole autism report with me and put these things in place. That's cool. And actually, would you say that your sensory needs have, have kind of changed over time, obviously from being a child and I know you were diagnosed quite late wasn't you? Yeah um, because I was diagnosed mid-20s I am um, in the 80s when I was born you know autism wasn't a it, it wasn't something that was widely discussed or acknowledged mm -hmm. and I was always kind of seen as a, a naughty person mm -hmm. you know I was acting up because of A, B, C and D um, there wasn't any kind of knowledge so I learned really young to to absorb everything that everyone was saying I needed to listen to the words that they were using that was the only way that I could determine what people meant if that makes sense mm -hmm. because I couldn't kind of take in the body language or what was happening socially or what anything kind of meant I analyzed every single word that was said and then I'd interpret what I thought the meaning was of what had been said so because I was masking and because I was constantly being my own therapist every day of the week, my strategies of dealing with it when I was little 
are much different to the way that I deal with them now as an adult because I, I don't need to analyze everything that everybody's saying. I'm now much more comfortable to be able to say, what did you mean by that? And somebody can kind of tell me. So because I'm not masking as much, I'm not as tired and I can deal with more. Mm -hmm. That's also changed the strategies that I use. I don't know if that makes sense. No, it does make sense. It does. Yeah, no, it does. Because I, I think sometimes we need to talk about how sensory needs change over time. They're not a static, you know, it's not static, is it? And it can change minute by minute, day by day as well, depending on many factors. Oh, definitely. And I think it changes person to person. There are some people that I know I can bear myself around and I can, I can put the mask down. I can kind of, I can just be myself, my authentic self. But I also know there are people that when I'm around them, that I, I, have, to, I have to be a certain way or I have to be quieter or I have to kind of respond in a certain way because of, not a lot of the time because of malice, but a lack of understanding. Yeah. You know, there's a perception that an action or a, a particular way in which you articulate yourself has an intent behind it, an intent to wound or an intent to deceive. But in actual mm -hmm. fact, it's because I'm confused and I'm trying to figure out what's going on here. <laughs> Yeah. Some, some people are emotionally intelligent enough to, to understand that immediately. Other people, if you explain it to them, they're happy to kind of listen and then they adjust the way that they are. And some other people, unfortunately, which I think I would say is fair for everybody, you know, the small minority just don't want to know. Mm -hmm. So person to person, sensory wise, you're kind of on guard as to where you're going to be. Yeah, and, and I think like everything with autism, there's a lot of misconceptions. So I remember many years ago working with a child who kept saying, well, the teacher's hurting me. And the teacher was saying, I'm not touching, I'm not touching him, I've not touched him. But all he was doing was walking past this child and actually to the child, that was, it was felt, that sensation was felt as physical pain and that was very real to that person. So I'm always really keen to discuss, Ashley, that, um, that idea that, sensory issues or differences can cause physical pain is that something you have experience of yeah i think when i get to the point of no return um I, i'll give you an example it's probably a better way of explaining this um I, when i was doing my second degree i decided because it was logical to take a job to help with the finances at home which was a, it was a mistake in hindsight. <laughs> At the time, it felt like it was the right decision. So I took a job driving buses for Arriva. Now, when I first started that, they sent me away to a depot to learn to drive the bus, which was fantastic. I really enjoyed that. I hadn't really thought it through. And I know this might sound a bit daft, but I hadn't thought of what the implications would be of meeting people face to face constantly. Yeah. All day yeah. and having to deal with that level of communication, I I tried to persevere. The manager was a terrible person. Um, I had a break and I had to go and have have therapy. Um, but I felt physical pain on a day to day basis, mm -hmm. and it was a reality. I would have, have, you know, I would start at six o'clock in the morning. And then you'd have people who were on to work who would be grumpy for whatever reason they were grumpy. But because I am like a sponge and because I'm, I naturally kind of want to help, that's my default set now. I'm a bit busy sometimes. But I naturally want to help. You know, I'd try to engage people, which in hindsight wasn't appropriate. <laughs> but that's the way I felt. I was responding emotionally to a situation that I was kind of absorbing. And when you get... Um, bombarded and you start to feel uncomfortable the first thing you notice is the pain in your stomach and that knot that starts to build and then it starts to feel like it's a boulder that you're carrying around mm -hmm. and then because I was I was sat in a cabin um, you would start to feel the heat there was no escape from it you know and as my defenses to kind of 
the outside world started to lessen, become physically painful because I'd, I'd, I'd have to continue communicating with people whilst thinking, I just want to strip off. Mm -hmm. I just want to cool down. I just want to lie down. I want to wrap myself in a blanket and I want to go to sleep for half an hour. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a real pain. It's not a, it's not a psychological kind of, you know, oh, my feelings are hurt. It's a physical pain that you feel. Um, and it does manifest from your environment, directly from your environment. Mm 